This episode of Space Nuts is brought to you by Moonshot, a podcast that explores the biggest ideas in technology and innovation and the people making them happen. You can subscribe to Moonshot wherever you get your podcasts from, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, etc. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello again, and thank you for joining us on Space Nuts, the podcast where we talk about uh, all sorts of things and occasionally astronomy. My name's Andrew Dunkley, and joining me from the far-flung reaches of North Queensland at a little place called Port Douglas is astronomer Fred Watson. Hello, Fred. Uh, hello, Andrew. How are you going? I'm good, and, and the reason that your sound quality is slightly down is because you're in Queensland. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> Uh, for those who don't know, New South Wales and Queensland have a, um, a, a fair bit of rivalry, particularly around the football season, and any chance we get, because they beat us all the time, to stick the knife in, I'm more than willing to do so. So there it I'm is. I'm not to that. <laughs> Fred stays out of it. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, today, Fred, we're going to be looking at uh, a, a rather fascinating discovery, an asteroid that they think has come from another part of the universe, from what I can read. Uh, it's not one of our own. It's just sort of blown in here like you. And uh, some strange auroras uh, around Jupiter. And then we're going to answer a question that's come from uh, Peter in Cork, Uh about uh, the speed of light. So we'll get to that later, Peter. But first up, uh, this amazing discovery uh, that uh, astronomers, such as your good self, have been waiting and hoping for for, for quite some time, from what I understand. Uh, exactly, that's right. So so um, l l let me just put this into, into context and explain how it is we know that this is very special. Uh, when, when we discover asteroids uh, uh, flying past the Earth, what are called near-Earth asteroids, uh, they, they are always in what we might call closed orbits, orbits that, that kind of repeat themselves. So a circle is a closed orbit, but usually asteroids are in elliptical orbits. That means they're like an elongated circle. But they go round and round, they go round and round the sun, uh, and um, everything's well behaved, unless they, of course, try and be in the same place as the Earth at the same time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, when you look at comets, they are often... Uh, at, uh, what we call long period comets are often in a in a different uh, setup. So a comet comes into the solar system, uh, flies by the sun, and then whizzes out again, and essentially only does that once. But if you waited maybe a million years, it would come back again. Uh, what it's telling you is that it's in a very very elongated orbit. In fact, we call it a parabolic orbit because that's the shape of of the orbit as it as it passes around the sun. It comes in, goes out again, uh, but it would it, it would probably come back um, if if it you know, if it was unperturbed by the gravity of anything else, it would come back maybe in a million years or something mm. like that. But this one, um, and this is what, as, as you said, astronomers have been waiting for something like this for decades. It's uh, an object that has come in on an orbit that tells you that it is from outside the solar system. Uh, it's from interstellar space. That means the space between the stars because the orbit is in the shape that, that we call a hyperbola. It's a hyperbolic orbit, and that means it will never, ever come back. It whizzes past the sun once and then speeds on its merry way uh, once again, escaping from the gravity of the sun. So this is a rock that has come from a very distant solar system from probably um, a, a time when uh, a solar system was forming its planets. We don't know where, which one it's come from. We know the constellation. It came from the constellation Lyra, um, uh, and, and he's actually heading off in the con constellation of Pegasus at the moment. But we don't know which star uh, is its parent star, if I can put it that way. Uh, very interesting and exciting stuff. It was discovered in Hawaii, actually, uh, by the university's University of Hawaii's Pan Stars Telescope, which I visited. It's uh, uh, on um, um, uh, the island of Maui, in fact, uh, a place called Haleakala, on, on top of the, the volcano there, uh, extinct volcano, I should should add, um, or at least dormant. Yeah, well, we uh, hope so. <laughs> yeah, with 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 several other telescopes, but Pan Stars is one of these telescopes that's looking specifically for. Uh, uh, near Earth objects, uh, objects that <clears throat> um, pass close to the Earth's 
uh, you know, the, the, the Earth's vicinity. Uh, and it detected it um, uh, back in, actually, uh, only a couple of weeks ago, as we stand now, 19th of October. Uh, it was at its closest uh, to the Earth, actually, bef uh, before that. Um, so we saw it sort of on its way out. Mm. Uh, it, was, it was closest to the sun on the 9th of September. Um, um, and basically, its, it's uh, path took it under the solar system. It kind of z z you know, zipped downwards underneath the solar system. Uh, 14th of October, closest to the Earth, at about 60 times the moon's distance. That's about 23 million kilometers or something. And he's now heading... Uh, back, as I said, towards the constellation of Pegasus uh, at a rather cool 44 kilometres per second. So that's the key to it. The fact that it's moving so fast is why it will never be captured by the sun's gravity and why it is a, an, uh, we know it's an extrasolar system object. Is it too late to analyse it and learn, um, you know, perhaps a bit about its makeup and see if it's different from the kinds of things that we consider normal that are flinging around our solar system? Yeah, it's a great question, and of course, it's what astronomers would want to do. Um, it probably is now, but um, my understanding is that a number of observatories actually had a look at this object. The, the thing is, it's probably only you know a third of a kilometre across, and and at the distance. Um, well, we didn't know about it at its closest pass to the Earth. We only found it, you know, five days after it had passed closest to the Earth. But at the distance we saw it then, there's not really much more you can see than a dot of light moving uh, among the stars. <clears throat> but you can learn stuff from the colour of that dot. If you do, um, you know, if you, if you use special colour filters, then you can get an idea of, of its surface. And, and even more so, if you can get a spectrum of it, this, you know, this rainbow spectrum that astronomers love, that contains this barcode of information about whatever it is you're looking at or whatever it is as reflected sunlight in the case of this object. Um, I don't know yet what those observations, if they were made, have revealed, but um, when we find out, and I'm sure we will, uh, Space Nuts will be the first uh, podcast to hear about it. Mm. Now, it stands to reason that there's possibly been more of these in the past that we've never seen. Uh, but this is this is actually the first time we've ever detected something flying through our solar system from another part of the universe. Would that be correct? Yes, that's right. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's technically given you know given the dimensions of our galaxy, hundred thousand light years across, and containing about four hundred billion stars, you can probably limit it and say this is an object from another part of our galaxy. Um, it's unlikely that it's come from intergalactic space. And the reason for that is that even at the speed that this thing's traveling at, uh, it Time. would take two billions of years to get here. Yeah. Um, you know, things don't form that early in the universe, although we're learning about that all the time. Mm. Um, I think one, one thing that's interesting about this, though, Andrew, is that, um, you know, the, the body that um, uh, is um, actually um, it's the only one that's empowered by international treaty to name celestial objects, it's called the International Astronomical Union. Yes. And they have all kinds of naming schemes for um, asteroids, comets, uh, everything follows various protocols. Um, there's a, certainly a very strict and well-established naming scheme for asteroids. You, get it, you give it a temporary name, <coughs> which usually in, involves the date and a few other the numbers and, and uh, digits uh, and, and letters as well. But there is no naming scheme in place for extra uh, extrasolar asteroids. So this is the first oh, one. So there's no, so they, no policy? Yeah, they've got to invent a, a way of giving it a name. So um, the they, could, they could really think outside the box on this one. Well, yeah, <laughs> they won't, though. Uh, yeah, probably. What they, call, they could call it, you know, you know we, we've come up with names for the, uh, the dwarf planets we've discovered. We could call it Fredna. Uh, Fredna, oh, I like that. I do like the sound of that. <laughs> That's a pretty I'm good with one. with you there. Yeah. But at the moment, um, it's got a temporary name, which is A2017U1. Cool. So, that is yeah. cool. I'm writing that down. Um, I don't think get much better than no, that. No, no. Oh, well, it's very exciting that we've found something so rather extraordinary, and it does suggest that there is stuff flinging around between galaxies that um, we probably didn't think about too much until now. So, yeah, it is quite a find, and we'll keep an eye out for more of them, see if anything else turns up. Uh, one more question. Uh, I know you said they're not sure exactly where it came from, but please tell me it didn't come from Clandathu. 
I got you there, didn't I? I got um, you. I don't believe, uh, well, I, I thought you were going to ask me about Nibiru, <laughs> which likewise doesn't exist either. Can, tell me about Klandathu. Uh, it, uh, it's, uh, it's our major enemy in the movie Starship Troopers, and they throw asteroids at us. I had a feeling it might be that. <laughs> oh, my geekness just erupted. Uh, we'll stop right there. And uh, you're listening to Space Nuts uh, with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Now, let's take a little bit of a break and bring you a few words from today's sponsor. And today's episode of Space Nuts is brought to you by Lawson Media, uh, the makers of a new podcast, Moonshot. Moonshot is a podcast exploring the biggest ideas in technology and innovation and the people making them happen. The Moonshot ideas discussed on the show are about to change the world as we know it. Topics already covered include the efforts to go to Mars, the rise of artificial intelligence, humans augmenting their bodies with technology, flying cars and jetpacks. Uh, So that probably gives you the picture. There are also great in-depth discussions with entrepreneurs like Brian Johnson, who has invested $100 million of his own money to build chips that will be implanted in your brain to fix problems and maybe even allow you to learn new skills or abilities in an instant. (laughs) Just imagine that. Moonshot is hosted by journalists Christopher Lawson and Andrew Moon, and includes awesome theme music from Breakmaster Cylinder, who did the music for the Rely All podcast. You can subscribe to Moonshot on Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Stitcher, Castbox.fm, or wherever else you get your podcasts. For more information, you can visit Moonshot.audio. That address again, Moonshot.audio. And I'd like to thank Lawson Media and Moonshot for supporting Space Nuts today. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, uh, something a little closer to home, only a little closer, uh, and that is uh, something in our solar system that has been observed by scientists uh, who have detected um, X-ray auroras uh, on uh, Jupiter, which um, are uh, quite compelling and quite amazing, and uh, they look extraordinary too, unless that's just an artist's impression I'm looking at. I don't know, to be honest. Depends which, depends which picture you're looking at, but um, there are, certainly are images of these aurorae. And you're right, this is, um, these are observations that have been made uh, not from Jupiter's vicinity. They've been made from X-ray telescopes which are in orbit around the Earth, uh, two of them, in fact. Um, so uh, to, to receive X-rays from space, um, you can't do it from the Earth's surface because uh, they don't penetrate the atmosphere. And so um, there are a number of X-ray satellites, uh, one in particular, Chandra, which is a very well-known one, which observes the universe uh, in, in X-rays. That's a NASA spacecraft. I'm not sure what the other one was that was used for this. But um, astronomers uh, based, I think they're based in the UK, uh, Uh, have observed, yes, University College London, have used these X-ray satellites to look at the auroras on Jupiter. And, of course, the auroras are the northern and southern lights. We have them here on Earth. Mm. Um, It might be a surprise to realise that aurorae emit X-rays, but they do. Um, We we normally think of them as just emitting visible light, but you can actually detect them with radio waves as well. They they are a kind of uh, um, multi-wavelength phenomena. So um, these scientists have looked at Jupiter with uh, X-ray telescopes and uh, analysed the aurorae that are seen, the northern and southern aurorae. In fact, for the, it's the first time uh, that the southern aurora has been observed on Jupiter. But the really interesting stuff about this uh, is that they are quite different uh, from the aurorae, the northern and southern lights on Earth. And we, we sort of already knew that. Um, the aurorae on Earth, are caused when the sun hurls out subatomic particles, that the sun's always emitting this breeze of subatomic subatomic particles, we call it the solar wind. But from time to time, disturbances on the sun, which we've talked about many times, fling um, large bundles of these subatomic particles into space. And when they finally reach the vicinity of Earth, they're funneled by the Earth's magnetic field. In fact, they do very weird things. They go beyond the Earth and then twist around and come back and are funneled down the Earth's magnetic field towards the northern and southern polar regions. And you get these two um, 
uh, ovals of energy uh, where the aurorae are beamed in. They're called the auroral circles. We see one in the north and one in the south. And of course, that's why periodically um, I head up to, uh, to the Arctic to look at the, the aurorae underneath the, uh, the northern auroral oval. So uh, aurorae on Earth, um, well behaved, well understood, happens because of solar flares. And the key thing, uh, and this is the thing that's very different about Jupiter, on Earth, when you get an aurora in the north, there is an equivalent one in the south. They are kind of mirror, mirror images of one another. Okay. Um, not, not necessarily seen together because, of course, if you've got the northern Arctic winter, then it's the summer in the south and so you don't see the aurorae. Mm. Uh, but we know they're there because of X-ray and, and radio observations and all, all the rest of it. So um, that is quite different from Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter's aurorae, uh, it has been discovered, are quite asymmetric. They do not match one another north and south. And that's probably due to the fact that the, the source of the subatomic particles is different. Um, most of the aurorae on Jupiter are caused by a combination of Jupiter's intense magnetic field, which, if I remember rightly, is about a thousand times stronger than our magnetic field on Earth. But the particles themselves come from the vicinity of Jupiter. They're emitted um, from the surfaces of some of the moons of Jupiter. Uh, and basically, Jupiter sits in a cloud of subatomic particles, which themselves are funneled to, to make these aurorae. Um, one of the questions that these astronomers are trying to answer is, does the solar wind play any role in this at all? And I think the jury is still out on that one. Ah, okay. But what, it's, what they've discovered, though, is really weird. These aurorae, they actually pulse. Um, and they kind of almost have a heartbeat. In the south, uh, the aurorae pulse every 11 minutes, and you don't get that kind of thing on Earth. You get aurorae that come and go, but it's completely irregular. Um, we know from standing underneath these aurorae that sometimes you can wait a long time for something to happen, uh, and nothing does, and sometimes um, it, you're just uh, overwhelmed by the amount of activity in the sky. On Jupiter, it's not like that. You get regular pulsations, and apparently... Um, there is a different pulsation in the north. I think there's another one that runs at a uh, distance of about um, of about two, uh, sorry, 45 minutes. Um, so uh, here's a quote from uh, from the scientist at the uh, University College London. Uh, While the southern aurorae give off pul pulses like clockwork, uh, they're less predictable in the north. And uh, uh, this uh, astronomer, whose uh, whose name is William Dunn, has said uh, sometimes. The northern one pulses at 45 minutes. Sometimes it pulses at 12 minutes, and sometimes it pulses erratically, which okay. is weird, especially when the one in the south pulses every 11 minutes. And very fast. The next thing you're going to tell me is that they don't know why. And um, well, the really interesting thing about this, Andrew, is that they don't know why. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, yeah, that's exactly right. The uh, mechanisms for this are really not understood. Uh, of course, we do have um, an additional uh, piece of the jigsaw that we can put in place now, though, because the Juno spacecraft is in orbit around Jupiter. Mm. Juno was not involved in these observations. And one thing I forgot to tell you is that um, the, the, the two space telescopes that took these uh, observations actually did it uh, on, in, uh, on two separate occasions, 10 years apart, 2007 and, and 2016. Um, so that gives you a kind of long baseline to see what, what's happening there. Uh, but Juno at the moment is in an orbit around uh, around Jupiter with um, every every 53 days it passes over and under the poles um, and so uh, Juno is basically investigating the magnetosphere the magnetic region around Jupiter which we hope will show a lot more insight into why these peculiar pulsations are happening and why why you know why Jupiter is behaving as it always does in a completely unexpected way do do we see aurorae on other planets aside from Jupiter? Jupiter and Earth? Um, we do. Uh, we see them most especially on the gas giant planets. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the four gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, all have uh, very strong magnetic fields. Jupiter, by far the strongest, but the others have strong magnetic fields and they all have aurorae as well. There is some um, 
I, I guess you'd call it speculative evidence of a Rory on Mars. Mm. Mars has a very weak magnetic field, but there have been illuminations seen in, in its upper atmosphere, which are not really understood, and it's not clear whether they're clouds or some sort of weak auroral activity. Uh, but um, but th there may be a Rory on Mars. Okay. Uh, so magnetic field, possible a Rory, no magnetic field, you don't get nothing. That, that's correct. Mm, that's right. Fair enough. All right. Well, we'll certainly watch these with interest. Um, it's been a, a fascinating uh, observation indeed. Uh, this is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here. And we're talking to Fred Watson. Three, two, one. Space Nuts. Finally, Fred, uh, a question from our vast uh, audience and uh, Peter how are you it's nice to talk to you and uh, when we have more listeners we'll get questions from other people but um, Peter Stoyanov uh, who's not a cosmonaut uh, he's from Cork has sent us uh, a little note and a question hello there love the podcast amazing job guys oh thank you Fred doesn't do anything uh, there's a question that uh, might be uh, an interesting one if we presume that normal objects can't go beyond the speed of light how did the universe expand so fast when the Big Bang occurred? Uh, so faster than light speed is actually in the realm of possibilities, question mark. It's, um, yeah, he says, I hope I got the question right. Thanks, uh, have a good one, and may the force be with you. <laughs> uh, also with you, Peter. Uh, so is faster than light speed actually within the realms of possibility? And did that happen as uh, a consequence of the Big Bang? Uh, well, the answer is yes, but it, it's in a rather special way. Um, so uh, what Peter said in the question is absolutely right. Uh, the ultimate speed limit of objects traveling through space is the speed of light, uh, 300,000 kilometers per second. Nothing can go faster than that uh, through space. But space itself can do bizarre things. And that's the key to, the, uh, to this question. So the Big Bang, uh, as, uh, to the best of our understanding, occurred about 13.8 billion years ago. Uh, something happened, there was an expansion of the universe. But we've known since the 1980s, and these are, this is um, you know, something that is widely accepted among cosmologists, that what happened was that, that the Big Bang was the instant of creation. But very shortly after that, the universe went through this period of kind of uncontrolled, violent, violent expansion. Uh, we call it the epoch of inflation. Oh, uh, because I love it. In inflated yeah so we're living in the epoch well we're not actually but we have lived in epochs of inflation uh, in recent years which are all to do with uh, financial things this is nothing to do with finances it's about the size of the universe and uh, it's speculated that the universe expanded uh, by a factor of about 10 to the power 50 so think of a one with 50 zeros after it that's yeah. how much it got um, in something like 10 to the minus 30th of a second. It's a tiny, tiny fraction of time. Now, of course, that means that the universe was basically itself was expanding faster than the speed of light, much, much faster than the speed of light through space. Uh, but uh, the space, the, the speed limit still holds because for things traveling through space, you can't exceed the speed of light. But, the, but space itself can do anything it likes. It can go faster. Um, the, the, the reason why we are so convinced about this period of inflation, Andrew, is uh, because the, it, it's the bottom line is that the universe is so uh, even throughout. Um, it's pretty much the same in all directions. We have a special word for that. We say it's isotropic uh, if it's the same in all directions. And, it, and it's basically uniform. I mean, we, I know there are galaxies and clusters of galaxies and things like that all dotted in it. But its overall global properties are the same in all directions. And what that suggests is that there was this early period of violent expansion that sort of stretched everything out, that evened everything up so that wherever you look, you see the same kind of thing. Um, great question from Peter, and uh, that's the answer, that uh, yes, we can't travel through space any faster than light, but space itself can. Okay. I hope that's sorted it out for you, Peter. Thanks for the question, and keep them coming. We love to hear from you, uh, whether you're just making a comment, an observation, or you do have a, a question that you'd like to throw at Fred, and um, he'll go and look it up in a book. Uh, or... <laughs> 
actually. Which he's written himself. <laughs> Which he's written himself and can't remember what he wrote. <laughs> Uh, Fred, uh, thank you uh, for uh, talking to us uh, again this week and, and, and thank you for doing it uh, from your isotropic location in North Queensland. <laughs> yes, I'm in the isotropics, that's right. <laughs> yeah, North Queensland's very, very tropical. Very be, be fairly warm up there at the moment, would it not? Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty humid as well. <laughs> yeah, well, I know you're coming down to uh, where we are in Dubbo uh, to uh, go to the, um, the, the final of the High School Science Challenge, which Dubbo is hosting this year, and, and we've even got a local school uh, in, into the final eight. So we're very excited about that, and, uh, and you're, the, uh, you're the guest speaker. I know they've been after you for a while. I believe so. Yeah. And you ended up there farming. Yes, indeed. <laughs> All right, good to talk to you, Fred. We'll catch up again very, very soon. Sounds great. Thanks, Andrew. All the best. That's Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory, and he joins us every week on Space Nuts. Thank you for your company. Don't forget to uh, tell your friends about us, uh, share us on Facebook or whatever platform you use, uh, and fire us some questions anytime you like. We'll try and get through them all eventually. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, we have a lot of fun and we hope you enjoy it too. And don't forget our sister podcast, Space Time, with Stuart Gary, which you'll find on um pretty much every um, podcast distributor that, uh, that we use as well. Until next time, thank you so much for listening to Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes, Audio Boom, and Stitcher or your favourite podcast distributor. This has been another quality podcast production from Sites.com. This episode of Space Nuts was brought to you by Moonshot, the podcast that explores the biggest ideas in technology and innovation and the people making them happen. You can subscribe to Moonshot wherever you get your podcasts from, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, and so on. Moonshot. Check it out today.